Hello, my name is Stephen Rust, and my presentation for the 2021 Association for the Study of Literature and Environment Conference is titled, What Price Beauty? An Eco-Critical Analysis of Merchant Ivory Productions. I teach cinema studies and first year composition at the University of Oregon in Eugene, Oregon. The university is located on Kalapuya Ihili, the traditional homeland of the Kalapuya people who were forcibly removed by the US Army between 1851 and 1855 to the coast reservation. Kalapuya descendants are today proud members of the Siletz and Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde here in Oregon. Merchant Ivory Productions was formed in 1961 by the director James Ivory, who is seated uh, next to screenwriter Ruth Jabala and the producer Ismail Merchant. Ivory was born in 1928 in Berkeley, California and grew up in Klamath Falls, Oregon. His archived papers are housed along with Ruth Javala's uh, screenplays uh, and other uh, film projects at the University of Oregon Special Collections. Ivory and Ishmael Merchant met uh, in 1959 in New York where Merchant had come to see a screening of Ivory's first film, a documentary called Venice Theme and Variations. Although they kept their romantic relationship secret throughout Merchant's life, it's known today that they fell in love almost immediately and formed a creative uh, and romantic partnership that lasted until Merchant's passing in 2005. The company formed in 1961 and shortly thereafter, Ruth Javala joined after she was approached by Merchant and Ivory to write the screenplay uh, to adapt one of her novels, The Householder. They met in India where she was living. Um, Jabala was born in Cologne, Germany in 1927, emigrated to England in 1939 uh, due to the um, Nazi party uh, and Merchant was born in 1936 in Bombay. Jabvala passed away in 2013 and her passing marks the end of the longest creative collaborative partnership in the history of motion pictures. Ivory is still working today well into his 90s and is um, perhaps known to those of you in the audience who are younger for his uh, Academy Award winning film, Call Me By Your Name. Uh, which he did not direct, but uh, for which he wrote the screenplay. And he was awarded uh, the Academy Award, uh, became the oldest person to ever win an Academy Award, um, winning for best adapted screenplay at the 2018 Oscars. My interest in Merchant Ivory Productions and the um, essay that I'm attempting to write for this project is a building off of my earlier work. Um, I began my career as a textual scholar and cultural historian, um, writing an essay on climate change films for eco cinema theory and practice, a book that I was incredibly lucky to co edit with Salma Manani, who teaches at Gettysburg College, and Sean Cubitt, who's currently at the University of Melbourne. We collaborated again for Ecomedia Key Issues, which came out in 2016. And by then, my research had begun to shift because uh, I began to have a better understanding that to truly take on what we call eco-criticism, media eco-criticism, we have to account not only for texts themselves, the movies and the other kinds of media that we consume, but the production practices that were used to create them. So over the past decade, eco-media studies has emerged as a corrective to the mainstream environmentalist view of visual culture and eco-literacy. Many scholars continue to define eco-media as a genre or a mode of production, um, highlighting movies and other kinds of media texts that seem to aspire to retrain viewers' perceptions of the natural world, 
to focus on environmental justice, to present biocentric and ecocentric viewpoints, and to actively seek to retrain viewers' perceptions and raise issues of ecological importance in the world. But as I began to undertake my, um, you know, going back and re-watching all of the, the 40 plus Merchant Ivory films and doing my, some of my initial background reading uh, on the production history of the company, it soon became apparent to me that framing a company like this which really did not ever position itself as an environmental company, um, as having a, a, a tr profound interest in ecological issues, at least directly, um, wasn't going to work, right? It's sort of a false labeling, I think, to kind of come along and look at a company um, that hasn't been attempting to, to do sustainable filmmaking, for example, as to suggest that um, they are eco, eco media. Instead, what I found is that relying on that skill of considering eco-criticism not as a way of making texts, right? Texts like this that aspire to something ecological, which is a fantastic thing to aspire to. Uh, and don't get me wrong, I do find um, definitions of eco-cinema and media that focus on the texts themselves and what the texts are accomplishing or attempting to accomplish very fascinating. But I just found that when it came to Merchant Ivory, what I had to do is remind myself that we have to take a broader perspective. Um, so if you look at the, the third bullet point here, for me, treating the term eco-media as shorthand for eco-media studies, uh, media eco-criticism or um, Sina eco-criticism, as uh, Adrian Ivakiv once wrote, helps us treat literacy as a form of culturally situated theory and analytic practice, rather than a means of classifying and organizing media texts. In other words, Merchant Ivory become eco-media because of the way we view them and analyze them, rather than, you know, something uh, meritorious in the text themselves. The texts that are listed on the, uh, on the screen under production studies research have been particularly helpful um, in getting me to move past my, um, you know, I often wanna hold on to textual analysis because a discursive analysis, because it's what I'm comfortable with and feel best doing and push myself to continue to research um, the materialist flows of media production. So uh, here's just a, a small kind of visual sampling of some of the many, many Merchant Ivory films. Um, beginning in 1963 with The Householder, their first release, followed shortly thereafter a couple of years later by Shakespeare Walla, their second film, which came out in 1965, representing this early period of Merchant Ivory films which were um, shot in India for international distribution and shot um, in English, although the, the householder was shot um, in Hindi and in English. Then we get to the middle part of their career, beginning with films like Roseland in 1977, The Europeans in 1977, their American films, um, followed shortly thereafter by a long period of filmmaking uh, in Europe. And over the course of their career, they have continued to make films in, in India, such as the very popular Heat and Dust in 1983, in Europe, such as the very popular Morris from 1987, um, and in the United States. So uh, instead of looking at one or two movies or one or two texts, I'm also challenging myself to really sweep across the full history of this production company. And so in order to do that, um, to, to kind of help frame this move that I'm making, um, I think that this collage of images from the popular film Remains of the Day um, might be helpful. So a traditional eco-critical approach, my sort of traditional eco-critical approach would have been to look at a film like Remains of the Day and to think about all of these different sort of uh, 
locations, places, interiors, exteriors in the film, and to think about um, how the film's um, sort of indirect references to the natural world, indirect references to human ecology, um, frame the narrative, frame what happens to the characters. Um, however, um, as I've explored the production studies approach to things, what I'm learning is, is how much more um, I can evoke or try to evoke by thinking about not only um, uh, what does this shot, for example, in the rain represent, but how was this shot created? Um, this use of artificial rain, the use of artificial lighting. In Merchant Ivory's case, um, Ismail Merchant's incredibly uncanny ability to talk his way into locations that no other filmmaker could get access to um, in some of the finest houses of the, the, the uh, aristocratic families of England and other parts of Europe to get access to these. And then thinking about like, how does a production company go in, how did they go into these, um, these, these mansions and elaborate state houses that were built uh, in the pre-electrical era um, and what kinds of infrastructure did they find? How did they um, account for bringing in all of the accoutrement needed to set up and shoot on location? And then finally, um, something that uh, in this image is perhaps captured um, only by the, um, the movie poster here, what happens when a film moves into post-production? And what does the, uh, what kind of impact is involved not only in the making of the films themselves, but in the distribution of these films around the world and all of the accompanying um, advertising um, and hobnobbing that has to go on um, at film festivals and places like that to make these kind of deals happen. So I've been really drawing on my, I, my experience. I don't get to teach graduate students in, in my, position. I teach a lot of undergraduate classes, first year cinema studies classes and media studies classes. And I've been drawing on that kind of, uh, uh, I teach like introduction to film so often that I've been falling back on these basic terms of pre-production, production and post-production to think about how the ecological life cycle of an individual film and then by extension, an entire film production company um, involves not just thinking about what happens on set, but many other factors. So in pre-production, for example, right, we have our three key players. In pre-production um, and all the way through the process, clearly the person who has the smallest climate impact, the smallest um, carbon footprint of the three is Ruth Jabala. Although she did conduct a, a lot of air travel in her life, um, living half the year um, in New York in a house that she purchased in 1976 with Ivory and Merchant, um, and also constantly fl sorry, flying back and forth between uh, New York and her home in India where her, her partner, Cirrus Javala lived, um, and then flying back and forth between film sets, flying out to award ceremonies, all of those kind of things. But she definitely had the, the smallest ecological impact because she spent most of her days sitting in very sparse hotel rooms or her own very sparse home and just writing and writing and writing and writing and writing, producing pages and pages and pages of text, um, using a lot of trees, um, but also having a, a much less impact because when we get to production, right, we're thinking about um, Jim Ivory being on set. So in pre-production, Merchant and Ivory traveling around, finding locations, there are stories of them. For example, I, um, Ivory talks about, uh, we, we looked at that still from Remains of the Day. Ivory has talked about, for example, visiting nearly every manor home in England or every manor home in Ireland to try to find the perfect house or, or set of houses to use for certain productions. Beyond production, uh, Ivory is responsible for the, um, the flow of activity and working with merchant. Um, but as director, right, kind of, we, we might think of Ivory as having the biggest impact, not only um, 
marshaling all the technology, but marshaling and extracting resources from all these crew members um, who, who uh, would contribute. And then we might, you know, our, again, all three of them are associated with all three practices, but we think about merchant perhaps being the most directly associated with post-production, particularly the enormous amount of time and energy that Ismail merchants spent on airplanes flying between Asia, Europe, and the United States meeting with potential financiers. Um, so many meetings, so many missed opportunities um, to get these films financed and just constant travel. Uh, merchant throwing huge lavish parties uh, for films at the Cannes Film Festival, trying to attract critics, trying to just show off Merchant Ivory. Um, for the, the 1972 film Savages, for example, um, I think Merchant uh, estimated at what point that just throwing the week-long party at Cannes um, for the films, uh, you know, attempt to get worldwide distribution and, and publicity uh, cost as much as the budget for the film. I've done uh, quite a bit of initial archival research so far. Um, I've spent about uh, 50, 60 hours uh, so, uh, to date um, in uh, the, the James, working with the James Ivory and Ruth Javala papers, um, which have been enormously helpful, right? Thinking about the material impacts of pre-production, um, all of these wonderful notebooks, um, directors production notebooks uh, of uh, Ivory sketching out shot by shot his films, similar notebooks um, with pages and pages of draft material by Javala. Um, little gems like um, budgets here where uh, Ivory is keeping track of all that he's spending on petrol, um, feeding crew members and things like that. Receipts for all of the uh, canisters and canisters of film that had to be um, developed, most of which of course is never used in the finished film. Um, and I even found this wonderful gem uh, of a cartoon drawn by a, a crew member that was tucked into the, the householder archives, their first film. And in this, uh, even in the archive, we think all the way through post-production as well, these ticket stubs are from a premiere event, a gala premiere that was a UNICEF event that was just sort of created by merchant um, with the purposes of drawing attention to the film uh, in an, any attempt to try to get a distribution deal. Uh, and, and it actually, it paid off. It was the only way the film got distributed was that uh, a 20th Century Fox producer uh, or executive came to um, the householder premiere that which was billed as a sort of benefit for UNICEF. And finally, um, to take things even one step further is kind of my last project, right? Thinking back to what comes before pre-production and what comes before pre-production is the origins. As um, somebody who grew up in a small rural logging town in North Idaho, I have this affinity for James Ivory who grew up um, in Klamath Falls. James Ivory's father owned a timber company and used the money um, from timber to uh, fund several of Ivory's first films and to leave him quite a significant inheritance when he passed um, that Ivory continued to use to finance films. And so the origins of Merchant Ivory are in clear cutting. Um, what does that mean? Um, how can we connect that, for example, to Ruth Javala and Jim Ivory's use of paper all the way through their process? Um, and I've been reading some wonderful passages from Wabenwal Kimmerer's um, essay, um, The Honorable Harvest, and thinking about what it means to confront paper consumption. And then finally, I've included some images of here of these different iterations on VHS, on DVD, and then on Blu-ray, um, which we can think of as also streaming, to think about how the residual impact of a company like this continues long after these films are made. Thank you for sticking with me through this um, 19 and a half minute opening um, take on these. And I hope you enjoy the conference and have lots of questions for me about individual films, anything that you wanna talk about in Q&A. Thanks so much.